Good afternoon everyone. It's wonderful to see such a large crowd here this afternoon. My name is Barbara Payton. I'm the University Librarian at the University of New England and I'm convener of, the, of QLOC for uh, 2013 and 14. We have, we're expecting about 80 to 85 people in the, here in present in person today and I th we think we're nearly at that point. Uh, plus another 20 or so streaming uh, from different locations from the membership. So welcome to everyone and special welcome to um, our guest speaker, Gerard, Gerard Doherty and um, to our university librarians who are going to be panellists. Just before we do start and I do more formal introductions, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, mobile phone, please turn it off or switch it to silent. Uh, toilets are out the building and around the corner there somewhere, both men and women. The, um, the theme for the forum this year is positioning for the future. And there are many ideas about the role of libraries in the future. With such a fluid institutional, governmental, social, educational, technological and economic environment and such variation in envisioning, how might academic libraries prepare and position themselves for leadership, advocacy and the creation of value? Today we have uh, a number of different perspectives on this issue. The, our introductory speaker to set the scene for us is Professor Gerard Doherty from uh, Griffith University. Gerard is the Dean of Research, Arts, Education and Law. Before his appointment to Griffith University in 2013, Jerry was Professor of Phonetics and Dean of Research, Innovation and Business Development in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at Newcastle University in the United Kingdom. He is an accomplished researcher with a long history of receiving nationally competitive grants in the UK and Australia. Gerard will take questions at the end of his talk. Um, there will be an opportunity perhaps later in the afternoon when we have the Q&A session for Gerard to answer um, additional questions. But Gerry is quite happy to take questions at the end of his uh, talk initially. So please um, keep that in mind as, as the afternoon progresses. I'd now like to welcome Gerry to uh, the QLOC University Librarians Forum and invite him to speak to you. And Jerry's first topic is research futures perspectives from the humanities and social sciences. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, thank you very much. And I hope you noticed I embedded the uh, future focus of this meeting by getting the date wrong on the uh, slide, which is uh, all very fortuitous. Uh, now I've talked to I've talked to um, lots of librarians individually over many years, but never to a group of 100 or so. So um, you'll have to uh, forgive me if I at any point strain to um, preach you the blinding the obvious. Um, whoops, how does this work? That's it. Um, so um, yeah, my, I plead your indulgence in advance on, on that front. Um, so the aim of the talk today uh, is to uh, give you a flavor of what I see as some of the um, current and emerging uh, trends which I think are shaping the formulation of research strategy uh, within the, the HE, the higher education sector. Uh, and in the process, assuming I've pitched this correct, um, I want to, I'd like to be able to connect some of what I say to some of the debates and thinking which I'm sure um, will animate the discussions later on this afternoon around the role and agency of library and information services in supporting uh, the research activity of, uh, of universities. Um, and obviously, given my background, this will all be seen through the lens of the humanities and social sciences. So that's a kind of advance warning on that front. Uh, first, a bit about me, as, as was said earlier. So I'm Dean Research in the Arts Education Law Group at Griffith University but only new in that role, so I've only been in Australia since, um, since April. Uh, so I moved from Newcastle University in the UK to, uh, to Brisbane, um, <laughs> just back then. Of course, the weather in Newcastle is always like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I 
wish, I wish. Um, in Newcastle, I was, I was um, dean of, I have had various dean roles over the time, but my, my last role for about the last six or seven years was dean of research, um, innovation and business development. So it covered a kind of range of areas around uh, research, external engagement, commercial uh, type um, activity within the humanities and social sciences areas. And my role here is actually very similar in that respect. But of course, it's very different because it's in a completely new kind of context, political and social and historical and all the rest of it. So it's been very interesting to be here. And it's great to get this opportunity for a bit of debate today. Uh, my background, PhD, was at Edinburgh University, where I spent uh, many, many hours um, in, two, in two buildings shown here. The one on the left is the University Library in George Square in Edinburgh, fantastic resource. And the one on the right, 800 metres down the road, was the National Library of Scotland, a copyright library which had the most superb reading room. So this is back in the 80s when you actually spent time in libraries doing, <laughs> looking at journals and reading stuff. Um, but very fond memories of, uh, I mean, th these are great places to be, to be a student in and a staff member when I started working there in the 80s. Uh, my field of research is linguistics and phonetics, the study of speech and language. Um, and my, what, I, what I do basically is I, I gather together large corpora uh, of spoken language and I analyze those corpora in various, uh, in various ways, using computers to pull out generalizations around how people are speaking and uh, what sort of judgments people make about people when they listen to the way they speak. So that's a bit about me. Uh, so let me start by going through just, a, I guess, a personal view as to what changes I think are, are kind of coming our way. Um, I'm sure many of you will just be very familiar with these because I don't think I'm saying anything very original at all in this, but, but it might be useful to see them all kind of come together in this way. Uh, I think we're moving to a situation where we're going to see a much more even balance between uh, what people have referred to as demand-led versus supply-led research. Um, so by that I mean, supp by supply-led I mean research which is basically dreamt up by the researcher and kind of pushed out to the whoever wants to look at it, as opposed to demand-led which is um, where the questions are actually ar arise from, from the public, effectively, in all its different shapes and sizes and different forms, different organizations, and the challenge is then put to the academic community to say, tell us more about this, we need to know about this. And of course, a lot of that demand-led side derives from big ticket societal challenges which are just becoming ever more evident as the, as the, the years go past. So things like you know, the climate change and the environment, sustainability, aging, uh, there's all sorts of um, kind of ways of cutting, cutting up the cake in that respect, but um, this, uh, what, what, what I think this means for researchers is that there's, there's going to be a kind of greater balancing out, if you like, of these two modes in which research is conceived and, and designed. Uh, there's going to be greater interdisciplinarity. I mean, that, people have been saying that for years, but I think, but I think it really is happening, actually. Certainly my experience would, would, would kind of support that. But importantly, it's not interdisciplinarity for its own sake, okay? Where interdisciplinarity works, I think it works best when it's grounded in very good quality scholarship within particular subject areas. So people know their subject area, they know the, about the methods, they know about all the, all the stuff they need to within their subject area, but then they um, adeptly bring that together with somebody who's coming from a different subject area with the same kind of solid grounding and creating something, something new from that. That's what I mean by interdisciplinarity, and I think there's gonna be a lot more of it. Uh, I think as a kind of consequence of that, we're going to see many more projects which are collaborative in nature. Um, uh, and and it's, this is not something necessarily new for lots of subject areas, but in the humanities and social sciences, this, this represents quite a, quite a culture change, actually, um, for many researchers. Uh, and alongside that, I think we're going to come into an age of much greater cooperation across institutions in spite of the fact that the, the funding environment those institutions operate in encourages competition and, and for them to be constantly looking at what's going on across the river um, or, or wherever the, 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 the competition is perceived to be. So there's this kind of conflict between um, a kind of market which is very, um, very competitive in terms of higher education, but actually a sense that if you're going to really do good research and address some of these big ticket issues, you need to cooperate. Um, I think there's going to be a greater focus on uh, co-inquiry. Um, by that I mean designing, formulating uh, research questions in partnership with external organizations. In other words, organizations external to the academy 
Uh, and those organizations m will come from a much wider range, well, from a, f a very wide range of sectors. So from public sector, private sector, third sector, charities, voluntary organizations, all that sort of thing. Um, the, the amount of research which is formulated in that way is really growing uh, very, very rapidly. Uh, of course, we will have ever more performance management, more intensive performance management within institutions. It's already pretty intensive, but um, the availability of endless metrics, which I'll refer to a little bit more later, will only serve to, uh, to increase the, uh, the intensity of that, I'm almost certain. Uh, and I think, interestingly, what we'll get as well, there has been much less of this in Australia, I think, than we have had in, 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 in Europe on the whole. But I think we'll, it will enter a, a stage where there's much greater direction from research funding bodies um, in terms of um, what they want to fund research on, really. Um, and partly that's driven by their sense of having to be um, demonstrably providing value for money to the taxpayer who, who funds those bodies on the whole. Uh, and also because of the greater accountability burden which is there for, um, uh, for researchers and for institutions. And so I think, um, uh, yeah, I think, I think this, is, this is another big, big kind of change which is just in the process of happening uh, 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 pretty, um, uh, pretty rapidly right now, I think. Uh, so I'm going to give three examples of this, of how this has is, this is kind of shaped things. It, and and this, these are examples from the UK. So these are from my recent experience in the UK. But uh, I don't think I need to apologize for that, because actually, it, having just been here six months, it's pretty clear that the same straws are in the wind in Australia. So I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised to find this sort of stuff just coming over the horizon very quickly down here. Um, um, because all the same pressures, I think, apply um, to the sector. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, first, to just give you a, a snapshot of the new uh, strategic plan from the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, creation of doctoral training centres. Uh, and I'm going to say a little bit about the uh, way in which the societal impact of research has been factored into the national evaluation of research quality, um, which has, um, which submissions for which are due in next week, and which is driving everybody in the UK totally crazy at the moment. So Arts and Humanities Research Council first. Um, so the AHRC is the funding agency for the arts and humanities. It spends, get lots of money, it spends about 100 million pounds a year, so $160 million a year supporting postgraduate research and uh, research projects in the arts and humanities across the whole country. So it's a very, very important body for, the, for UK researchers. Uh, and it just put out its um, strategic plan last month, which is actually is a very interesting document to read. Um, it's really, really under the cosh from government. So the government is saying to H, you know, it's, it's kind of constantly been saying to HRC for the last few years, you show us value for money or we'll just shut you down. It's, it's been a really very um, tricky spot for it to be in um, from, a, from a, a kind of strategic point of view. But it's done very well. It's thrived. It's, it's received its funding. And it's been getting very good uh, kind of um, resonance back from, from government and from the Treasury in terms of what it's trying to do. So we've got a couple of slides here. Firstly, the way AHRC sees things now. The second one is what it thinks will happen. Okay. And the third one will just exemplify how it's responded to this, uh, to, to, to that kind of um, picture of the world, if you like, from the arts and humanities side of things. So the way it sees things now, it says research is increasingly a worldwide enterprise with closer collaboration, enabled by highly mobile researchers, swift communications, and rapid exchange of results. International environment highly competitive, requires careful responses from the UK, read Australia, to retain its world-leading authority and awareness that national research is inextricably international uh, in both subject matter and use. In other words, you can't, just can't be parochial about this. You've got to think globally, not, um, not nationally, and certainly not state, stately or state-wise. Um, when there's great pressure on the finances, researchers are being increasingly asked that the benefits of that investment are realized and made specific. Um, as the knowledge economy advances, more organizations, both public and private, are part of the creation of knowledge and more people are interested in its outcomes, which all of which means that there's an increasing demand for the freer circulation of ideas through, for example, yes, open access to publications. Uh, and then last point, norms of knowledge are changing with greater appreciation that complex problems require multidisciplinary 
multi-agent responses. That's kind of pretty all, all pretty much in line with what I said before. Um, so there's a kind of congruence there, if you like, between at least between the way I see the world and the way um, these people do. Second slide is what they think will happen. So this is their kind of prediction for the next um, for this period of their st strategic plan and a bit further ahead as well. Um, so they're seeing that knowledge will increasingly be produced between a range of bodies and not just within universities and colleges. Okay, this is the kind of co-inquiry, um, collaboration, external partnership type mode. Um, multiple agencies will support research, including those working across national, regional, and administrative bodies. That's code for them saying, we're not the only players in this game. Don't expect us to support everything. We're going to be focused on what we want to support, uh, given our mission as given to us by, by government, qua the taxpayer. That's, that's the way you have to read that. Um, older divisions between disciplines and between pure and applied work will diminish. Complex knowledge will demand different ways of working. Uh, there will be continuing need to bring arts and humanities researchers together to influence the context in which they work, to build consortia, cross-disciplinary networks, and multi-funder partnerships, and to support individual researchers to forge stronger relationships with academic, um, academics overseas. The signaling here a massive change in terms of how the arts and humanities um, uh, operates in terms of its, it, yeah, in terms of its modus operandi, how, how, how that research is carried out and how it has been carried out traditionally, which has been very much, certainly in the UK, has been very much focused around uh, a lone scholar type approach or small groups of scholars operating um, on, on, on their projects. Uh, and they see that um, new or enhanced skills and competencies will be needed, for example, in languages and cross-cultural knowledge, the potential um, of innovative technologies, data analysis, and the research emerging from creative practice. These will need to be developed alongside the traditional disciplinary expertise. So they're saying there's basically a big, dis a big capability issue here looking forward that needs to be addressed. Uh, and that's capability of researchers. And also institutional capability in order to deliver or the context within which um, these needs can be can be met. Um, so AHRC, if you look through that their strategic plan, and, and I think it is worth reading actually because it gives you a real flavour of how things are going to be. Um, one thing they've done is to uh, identify four um, areas where they would like to direct researchers to undertake research because these are the areas where they they think, having done a big consultation, they can extract. Um, significant value for money for the, for, the, for the nation from the investment they make in arts and humanities research. So this is an example then of what I said before around greater direction coming from the funding, funding agencies. So the four themes I've identified are these ones here. Care for the future. So they're looking for work which will generate new understanding of the relationship between the past and the future, how we transmit and question our heritage. Digital transformations, looking at um, how digital technologies transform research in the arts and humanities, and this will look at themes like IP, cultural memory and identity, communication, creativity. Science and culture, so the interaction between uh, science and the arts, effectively, uh, and translating cultures to explore understanding and communication across cultures, looking at the role of translation in its broadest sense in the transmission of languages, values, beliefs, histories, and narratives. I mean, it could have been four different themes, but these are just the four they relighted on. The point I want to make is that this represents a, a major sea change from a, an organization which five to ten years ago was simply saying, send us in your applications and we will fund the best research in the arts and humanities more generally. They're still saying they will do that, and I think they have to keep saying they will still fund really good research, whatever the kind of origin and kind of um, form that work takes, uh, um, what form it, it kind of it is when it's submitted to them. But at the same time, it's saying, we will go out of our way to ensure that a significant proportion of our funding is diverted to these four areas because we think these areas are important for the nation. These are kind of strategically critical from the point of view of the arts and humanities and delivering value for that public investment. So it's a really interesting process. Let me move on to my second area, which, which is kind of related to this really. Um, so this is about the creation of doctoral training centers, which as a, has the result of forcing institutional collaboration and embedding stakeholders, the users of the research, um, into, the, into the process of doctoral, doctoral studies. 
Um, so previously what happened in the UK was universities would apply to the research councils like the AHRC and say, we have um, some really good researchers, we've got a good track record with graduate students, please give us a quota of studentships that we can dole out to the best students who apply to us. And it was done very much on an institution by institution basis. Uh, what's happened in the last few years, every research council in the UK has said, nope, we're not gonna do that anymore. We want to create centers of excellence. We want you to form consortia whereby you will pool your expertise and your strengths in certain research areas uh, and you will, you will come up with programs of training and, and context for graduate students which pull out the very best that you can offer collectively as a consortium. And not only that, we want you to build into your consortium relevant um, organizations that will, um, that will kind of enhance both the training uh, that your students will receive in that, in that, um, uh, during their doctoral studies, but also people who you can work with in devising new research questions which will form the basis for doctoral uh, research. And so this just sent the whole place into a total spin because suddenly all these places that were typical, you know, natural competitors with each other found they had to start working together, sharing information, creating spaces within which their graduate students could come together, giving their students access to each other's libraries, for example, which is a major cultural thing in some places. Um, but the result is that within, really within three or four years, there's been a transformation of the doctoral training space across the whole of the UK. So just to give you an example from the humanities, or two or three examples of the consortia which have just recently been approved by the AHRC. Uh, so the, the, the whole of Scotland has a single consortium. And you'll see there, it, it includes universities which really are absolutely natural competitors with each other. Edinburgh and Glasgow, you can't think of two more <laughs> competitive institutions. But they're right in there cooperating and collaborating in order to enhance what they, to, to give, really a fantastic experience to their graduate students. And what's really interesting then is to look at the sorts of organizations that they've built in to these consortia. So you know, you've got really very, very important organizations within the kind of arts, humanities, cultural um, sector uh, working very closely. They're on the advisory boards, they're on the, the executive groups of all of these, um, of all these consortia. They're right at the heart of the, of the process. And this is, a, this, is, this is the government's way or the, the research council's way as an arm of government, to really force this issue around co-inquiry and around cooperation and really trying to create something which is bigger than the sum of the parts and to really to stop universities being very focused on just competing in a rather parochial sort of way, which actually doesn't necessarily do the students any good. Another example, this is the London one, just to give you a sense of the the organizations there, you know, King's and UCL, I mean, totally totally in competition with each other in many other ways, but coming together for this. The one I was involved in, Newcastle and Durham uh, and, and Queen's University Belfast, which geographically was challenging to put together, but it, but it has worked. Uh, and again, we, we drew in a wide range of, of really top-notch um, uh, cultural organizations within the region uh, and across Northern Ireland to kind of form part of the, 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 the kind of back, uh, backdrop for that. And of course, just to show you, some things never change, Oxford. <laughs> Oxford, <laughs> it's just Oxford. <laughs> no other partners in there. <laughs> so who knows what went on there, but I'm sure it will be an evolving process. There. Things take a long time in Oxford to happen. So. Cambridge was better. Cambridge had all sorts of interesting people built in there. Uh, so what this is basically saying is that collaboration is becoming a, it's a sine qua non. You've got to do it, basically. But of course, that raises a whole set of challenges that need to be addressed. Uh, external partners are shaping the context within which graduate studies are being pursued um, quite significantly now, uh, and also the research questions which are being addressed. Uh, and really, it's, it's amounting to a big shift in research culture and in the preparation of the next generation of researchers. So I think the next generation of researchers will have had a very different experience to, to our current, um, even our current early career researchers who haven't been through this sort of training. Uh, and then the, my third example from the UK, um, research impact. So in the 2014 Research Excellence Framework, that's the equivalent, the UK's equivalent to the ERA. Um, uh, the imp I want to just talk about the notion of an impact um, uh, case study um, and how that's been used as a currency for evaluating um, institutional performance. So in the, in the 2014 REF, the impact, the societal impact of research is weighted at 20% of the overall score that an institution receives for each of its subject areas. 
Uh, and this score drives huge amounts of revenue. It's m it, your, your funding can go way up or way down if you score well or, or badly on this particular exercise. So 20% is non-trivial, take it from me. What does impact mean? Well, it's, it's defined as the reach and significance of impacts on the economy, society, and or culture that were underpinned by excellent research conducted in the submitted unit. And submissions go in by a subject area within the UK as well as the submitted unit's approach to enabling impact from its research. So it's a very challenging, uh, challenging definition. Um, the way it's assessed is that institutions um, create impact case studies. So we had to create uh, one impact case study roughly for about every seven or eight members of staff that we submitted in each of our subject areas. Um, and these impact case studies were graded by, or will be graded by a panel of peer reviewers. And what the impact had to consist of basically, um, it basically needed to be some difference which had happened out there beyond the academy, uh, which could be explicitly documented and evidenced in the period between 2008 and 2013, and explicitly linked to a research output or research outputs which had been published between uh, 1993 and 2013. So, as you can imagine, what this gave rise to was a whole industry of investigatory work. Um, as universities hired in all sorts of people to help them with this. Because what you had to do was to track this connection between particular publications and uh, the influence which those publications had had, the, the, the difference which had arisen as a result of somebody picking up on that publication. Um, and so, for example, People were coming to us all the time saying, oh, I'm on the TV all the time, you know, um, uh, that must be fine for impact. I'm always in the newspapers. And, of course, the answer was, well, no, you've got to show that that's actually making a difference. You could be on TV all the time and actually not make any difference whatsoever. People could be turning you off, as far as we know. Um, and so there was a real sense of having to focus very closely on, on the, the, the evidence base and the documentary base for us to demonstrate this explicit connection between stuff we'd pushed out but as well in the form of research outputs and the difference which that had made in some aspect of the real world. So it was a very challenging task. Um, for the next ref, it's already flagged as having a higher percentage. So 20% was a bit of a concession to say, well, it's the first time we've done this. Let's keep the percentage low. <laughs> um, it's going to be higher next time. Uh, and I'm almost certain this is coming this way. And there's no doubt about it. You, you can hear the noises already. Uh, there's a really good website actually on this, which um, you should um, take a look at if you're interested in this area. It's, uh, it's if you just type in LSE, Impacts of Social Science, it'll take you straight to the to the website, and it's a gathering of writings and blogs and stuff that people have written on this topic. It's very very informative, uh, by way of background. Um, okay, so they're the, they're the kind of three examples I wanted to give. I just wanted to mention a few other changes that are afoot, and, and these are ones which I think will be more kind of aligned to your own interests as, a, as, a, as a, a, a group of people from a librarian information sciences background. So there'll be no surprises with any of this, I suspect. Um, yep, big data. You wonder when I was going to mention that one. Uh, I, the first thing I'd say is you have to be a bit careful with the hyperbole around this. I mean, you hear a lot of people talking about um, big data. Um, uh, it's clearly the case that a lot of people don't really, um, haven't really yet got their heads around what it really means and what the implications are um, for them. My, um, my kind of reading of it for researchers is that, yes, there have been very significant developments in relation to the scale and range of information which is available for analysis alongside a, a much greater diversity of tools for accessing and analyzing that uh, data. And, of course, a much wider range of organizations making data available. And this is all in line with what we know about greater public sector transparency and greater accountability on businesses and public sector bodies. It's all kind of part of the same, part of the same picture, really. In fact, there's a really nice story this morning in The Guardian in the UK where the Conservative Party had, for who knows what reason, had decided to wipe from its website 10 years' worth of speeches that its ministers had made. Um, saying this is to tidy up the website, oh yes. Um, only to be told later by the British Library that of course they'd been archiving everything for since 2004 and so it's all, it's all on the British Library website if somebody wants to get it. And, uh, so 
this whole question of transparency and accountability, people are still trying to work out you know, how, what it means for them as an organization. But um, uh, yeah, this is clearly a space which has changed a lot recently and continues to do so f and, and has big impact on, on researchers. Uh, it's not just an increase in scale from my point of view along one dimension, but it also increases the, p the potential massively for multi-dimensional type uh, data sets. So in my own area, for example, for years language corpora was simply uh, kind of uh, large amounts of transcribed um, recordings. Whereas now what people are doing is they're, they've got large amounts of transcribed recordings sitting alongside digitized video materials, sitting alongside di digitized um, articulatory data where they've been monitoring movements of the speech organs. It creates these huge questions of how do you handle all this dimensionality? But, but it's all there and people are doing it and it's, it's really, you know, has fascinating implications and great potential for the field. Uh, I think for researchers, there's a real risk of technology and the availability of data outstripping capability. And you know, I wonder for a country like Australia, but I'd say the same for the UK actually, um, how, do, how do you set about equipping your ECRs and, and graduate students with the necessary skill sets to enable them to compete internationally uh, when you know, the funding models are really driving people to be, um, to be um, competitive and to, in a sense, put, put fences up? Um, this, is a kind of, this is almost a kind of national strategic issue. Uh, and you can see in the UK, they're trying to address that by, by kind of forcing shotgun marriages, really, between institutions. And um, um, I guess, th yeah, there is a question there for, for Australia in terms of how it takes that forward, I think. Uh, publishing, another big change, perfect storm. You're all ultra aware of this, I'm sure. So Apple Open Access, big journal publishers, um, e-publishing breaking out all over the place. Everybody wants to publish a journal these days. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Um, obviously still developing lots of pitfalls all over the place, and lots of challenges. Um, for researchers, well, I think green green's better than gold. It's kind of as a, it's okay as a, as a model, uh, but still it leaves lots of issues unresolved. Um, I think one, issue, one of these is around the question of repositories versus websites. I know as a researcher myself, what I, my, my strong preference, and I think my colleagues would share this, is to be able to go to a, 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 if you find somebody whose work you're interested in, is to go to that person's website and find the PDF there on that website without having to then either go back to your own library site to dig it out from your own kind of open access um, um, set of journals or to go into some institutional repository at that person's site to dig it out. Um, and my, my feeling is, in my experience, and this, is, this might be completely out of sync with, with reality more generally, but my experience is that in the US, it seems just standard in my field. You go to somebody's website and their PDFs are all there and you can access that work straightforwardly. Certainly in the UK and from what I can see in Australia, it's certainly not systematically the case at all. And you often end up end in, a, in a repository of some sort, which may or may not give you easy access to a, to a PDF. But it, it just seems, there just seems there are barriers there which aren't necessarily present um, um, el elsewhere in the world. And that might be worth having a chat about later. Um, and then for, for the humanities and social sciences, is a big issue around how you address open access in subject areas which aren't focused on journals. A lot of this discourse is around journal publications, but of course, people in the arts and humanities write books, they produce creative outputs, they do all sorts of other things. Uh, and we're not yet as far down the track as we need to be in, 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 in working out how we address open access in, in the context of that sort of publication. Uh, metric related issues, again, this is meat and, meat and drink to you guys, so um, there's been a proliferation of metrics relating to the performance of journals, specific articles and authors. Um, but I think my perception is that there's some real issues around reliability and validity of these, uh, and I think particularly perhaps in the humanities and social sciences. So interestingly in the UK, in the, in the REF exercise I spoke about before, um, metrics have been used or will be being used in the science, um, technology, medicine areas, but the decision was made not to use them in the social sciences and humanities areas because they weren't considered to be reliable um, from that point of view. Um, so there's still, I think, big debates to be had around, around that. Um, I think for researchers institutions, the fact there is also so much stuff out there by way of metrics, I think actually leads to a lot of confusion and noise um, and, and conflict. And I think there's a couple of issues which fall out of that. Firstly, people struggle to find uh, where subject level quality is located because um, there's so much, there's just a proliferation. And I think for, particularly for ECRs and graduate students, it's a real challenge to work out, well, where's the really good stuff? 
And I think there's a role there for, there's clearly a role there for library information science uh, support. There's a big role though for actually for more senior researchers to be educating the, 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 the kind of early career people where to find that sort of stuff. Because actually a lot of that knowledge lies in people's heads. Um, and alongside that is, a, is an issue around where's the best place to publish an article or book for maximum impact. Um, but by maximum impact, what I mean is maximum impact with the segment of the peer group that the work is designed to influence, okay? And I choose those words carefully, because what this really means is that in writing, in writing uh, up research, people need, to, researchers need to be very, very clear about you know, who their audience is in terms of their peer group. And, and it's really on that basis that they can sensibly uh, start addressing the question of where's the best place to place this. And I've a feeling certainly, um, having worked with early career researchers for, for many years now, that there's a lot of uh, value to be had in, in getting people to think through that question of, well, actually, who am I talking to with this work? Who's out there that actually is interested in this? And how am I tuning what I'm doing to, 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 to kind of grab the attention of those people? And then, um, yeah, I think a third key issue is how to track the influence of an article or a portfolio of articles. Um, uh, and again, that brings me back to, well, how do we get metrics to cover other types of output beyond the journal, the journal article? Uh, I know there's lots of work going on around this, around how you track influence automatically. I think that's really interesting work. So the alt, the alt metrics kind of development, I think, is really um, uh, yeah, very interesting indeed. And it'd be good to kind of, um, I think, for researchers to hear more about how that develops in due course. So finally, what do researchers and their grad students want, need from an institutional um, library and information service going into the future? Um, well, all of this, of course. Um, but more, more specifically, again, this won't be, this won't be um, uh, news to you at all. Uh, so 24-7 mobile access, of course. Why would we want anything less? Uh, books, book chapters, not just journal articles, books, book chapters, theses, archives, databases, search engines, bibliographic tools, metrics of all sorts, all singing, all dancing. Uh, advice and support and all of that. Um, Know-how about where to find data and information, how to access it, how to make sense of it, because often data is difficult to get a sense of, really. How to reference it, um, how to deal with institutional walls. Um, so, for example, if you have co-supervision or if you have external partners involved in research, how do you, how do you kind of deal with some of those barriers which will inevitably um, arise uh, in, 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 in that process of co-working? Uh, data curation, I think, is, is something which... That's not a term I used until about five years ago when suddenly there was a big data curation agenda in the UK and everybody started worrying about it. And, but I think it's, it's, it's totally <laughs> established now as a big agenda. Um, so what do you do with the data you create? How do you store it? How do you archive it? How do you deal with all the ethical issues around it? Pretty critical stuff. Uh, and capability raising. I think is pretty important. So how do, what, what do we need to do to be able to keep our um, researchers um, which is a national asset with potential you know, massive economic value for the state, for the nation, how do we keep our researchers ahead of the game with respect to emerging technologies and new data sets so we're not playing catch up with the uh, people in the US, for example, or increasingly China, of course. Um, and of course, what people also want from a library and information science service is serendipity. So they still want the sense of being able to wander down the journal stack and have their eye be caught by something that looks interesting and say, oh, oh yeah, and make that connection. How we deliver serendipity in this current day and age, of course, is a really interesting question. Um, I don't quite, Scopus doesn't quite do it for me, I'm afraid, <laughs> from that front. Uh, and of course, the final thing people obviously always want in a library is... Um, that good coffee, um, and I say that I, I say that kind of it's, it's a bit flippant, but actually it's not as flippant as it seems. I spent two weeks this summer in the University of Michigan in, in the U.S., and what I noticed there was around the main campus there, there was a whole stream of coffee shops opening up, and they were coffee shops plus. And the plus bit was they had large rooms with docking stations for students and staff and graduate students to sit around. And when you wandered around those rooms, they were full all the time. Um, it was clearly staff in there as well as students, uh, all sitting on their laptops. Uh, and effectively what, you were, what these people were creating was, was um, you know, this new space where um, you know, the rationale, the ostensible rationale was come here and have a coffee. But actually people were going there to work 
and the coffee was just kind of there in the background. And people were sitting there all day. I mean, I, I was there working for a couple of weeks and literally sat there all day for several days at a time preparing the stuff I was teaching. Um, and it offered, a, yeah, it offered a really interesting, different sort of environment in which to, to, to undertake that sort of activity, um, but nevertheless have access to all the resources you would ever need. Um, so, yeah, I say that slightly flippantly, but not entirely so. Um, and just last point, all this, of course, we want to get at a time when resourcing will be as challenging as it's ever been. Um, and the result of this is that um, capturing value for money, I think, is going to be central in evaluating uh, service delivery and, and new service models. And so what we need then is clarity on those specific value for money metrics, which will gain traction with the research community uh, within an institution and which explicitly support the um, ambitions of our institutions in terms of excellence and ambition, uh, excellence and impact in terms of research. And of course, all this at a time when, when the sands are shifting in, in all sorts of different ways. So it's a really good time now for some joined up thinking between the research community and the librarian and information services community on questions like where and how is value added? How is it measured? And how do we position ourselves at the leading edge uh, in, in respect of all of this? And with that, I'll leave it for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. Very stimulating. We do have time for some questions. Um, Lucy has a microphone. She has two microphones, in fact, um, which she will share among all of you. You need to use the microphone so that um, those of our uh, participants who are streaming can hear you. And when, if you're asking a question, please um, give your name and where you're from. Those who are streaming, you will have to send your question via Twitter. Uh, and remember, the Twitter address was, 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 at QLOC. There's a risk of that, I think, but I think we, um, the kind of line we took, which I think was probably the right one, because the problem is uh, all this stuff will always come over from, from government and funding agencies, and you end up having to jump through so many hoops, but you, you've really got to be very clear about, well, what are we doing here? You know, we can't just end up dancing to other people's tunes all the time. So the line we took was to say, well, what we do at this university is we, we try and do really excellent research, um, full stop. Uh, but alongside that, we have, we have really good mechanisms for when we, uh, when we spot that that research um, has the potential to really make a difference with, uh, with some outside agency or community or organization, we have really good mechanisms for making that happen. Um, and so, so we weren't trying to say to researchers, do something different, because actually they were pretty good on the whole. Um, but what we were trying to do is to say, let's make sure we've got really good ways of, of, of making those connections. Um, between what you do and the people outside who might be who might be interested, and in a way, having having, for example, now got those uh, doctoral training consortia in place provides a really nice channel for that. Because suddenly you've got all these really interesting external organisations who are part of part of what you do, and they hear about the work going on, and, and they, you know they immediately start seeing, oh, yeah, we could use that for this or or whatever. And so, I think, I think, yeah, I think one of the corollaries of of the impact agenda has been to. Um, to really make institutions think hard about what their channels are to the outside world and making sure they're strong and, and relevant. Uh, so, yeah. And in terms of different subject areas, it was really interesting because we, when we first got into this, our, our, the medics, of course, said, ha, impact. We've got loads of impact case studies. You know, we, we're doing this, this, and this. Um, and all my colleagues in humanities were going, oh, my God, yeah, impact. 
how are we going to manage this? But as time went on, it became really clear that, of course, medicine, med medical research does have lots of impact, but it takes an awful long time for that demonstrable impact to emerge. So the, the time you need between you know, lab and um, delivery of some new drug is, is, you know, can be decades. Um, whereas um, when the humanities people started thinking about it, well, it turned out they were working with all sorts of people actually in the outside world, and we could, without too much difficulty in most cases, find some really interesting cases where they'd, they'd had major impact actually. So the end, you know, the last period before I left there, uh, it was the, the medics who were <laughs> kind of um, casting around seeing, do we have any more case studies we can bring to bear, whereas we had all ours sewn up. So it's, it's, a, it's a complex business actually. Alison Hunter from University of Southern Queensland. I'm interested in the um, doctoral training centres. Um, I'd heard a lot of what you were talking about, but this one was completely new to me. And I wondered whether the, the idea in the back of that, in terms of how we support, or how librarians support researchers, is that there's a move towards a doctoral training library centre, mm -hmm. and, how, and whether we're now going to be expected, as much as the researchers are, to, to work in a much more seamless fashion. Could you mm -hmm. comment on that? Yeah, well, when we put the bid in for the one I showed you on the slides, so the Newcastle Durham um, QUB um, uh, consortium, I mean, those those three um, library information services simply hadn't really been joined up at all. I mean, the, the, I think the Newcastle Durham people probably knew each other, but but only in a kind of, you know, maybe in this sort of forum where they would come together for regional type meetings. But there was no no real kind of strategic cooperation going on at all whereas when you put in a bid for this sort of thing you had to you had to make the case that you were your library information services would be cooperating in a way which was which was congruent with the objectives of the training center which are all about joining things up and playing to strengths and complementarity and breaking down barriers between between institutions so um, I think yeah I mean I think there's no doubt that if, 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 if that's the route that we're going down I think um, um, all sorts of support services, but certainly library information services would be would be kind of part of that story. I think. Yeah. Lucy, sorry, got to run back to <laughs> Hello, um, Wendy Abbott from Bond University. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of the skill sets that you were talking about for ECRs. Mm -hmm. um, could that be uh, the sort of thing where um, early career researchers know enough about statistics to know what a statistician can do for them, and enough about libraries to know what the librarian can do for them? I mean, it, I would have thought that there's so much to know that mm. they can't possibly have the complete toolkit mm. un under the bonnet, so to speak. Mm. They just need to know where to go. Yeah, well, I think that's the critical issue, really, because then, the, because that, that comes down to where is where is the where is the burden lie in terms of in terms of doing this stuff or engaging with these, some of these changes and I think you know I think I think it's ill-defined at the moment in terms of where that burden lies but I think I think pursuing that particular point and trying to trying to get some kind of equilibrium between uh, between the kind of yeah provision of of know-how by people who see that as their prime professional focus um, and on the other hand you know researchers who have following a particular set of research questions and who need to know some methodologies but just don't necessarily need to do anything else. So I think getting that, yeah, getting that balance right is, is, I think, right at the heart of the, of this, of, 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 of yeah, the debate, really. Um, and I don't, I mean, I don't know now what, you know, if there's a nice way of capturing the right equilibrium, but I think it's, it's, it's absolutely the right debate to be having. Bob yeah. Gary, University of Queensland, just following up on the OA question where to mm. deposit on the website or in your mm. institutional repository. I'll make a plug for the repository. Um, libraries obviously have spent a lot of time and effort over the no, years building yeah. institutional repositories. And in most cases, the repository manager, I'm sure, would be happy to provide a little snippet of code yeah. that would pull your publications into wherever you'd like them to be. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think I know that's right. I just think I just think the experience of the user. I mean, I, as it happens last night, I went around a few universities and just you know sampled, and it, it was it was variable. I mean, it's, it, it, in terms of what you get. Whereas I went to the U.S. to the you know the places I usually go to, and it's 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 consistent. And so I just think it's a question of um, yeah, 
it's a question of just making sure that, yeah, clearly the repository is a really important part of the, the, you know, what we provide, but making sure we don't lose out on the other side, I think. Yeah. Just to follow up to that, because um, I think there's two things at play here. One, <coughs> the longer term curation, mm. which is I think where repositories play a critical role. Yeah. The other is exposing yeah. the outcomes. Um, and yes, web page, obvious place to expose, mm -hmm. but there is a curation element as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess looking at um, your comments about the multi-agency uh, across borders, uh, multiple funding agencies, mm -hmm. so many players in a very complex arena, and they mention issues around IP and copyright, yeah. And, yeah. and how those issues might need to play through in that conversation. Mm -hmm. But I'm interested in your thoughts about curation Mm. Because there's increasingly the outputs of this research are digital mm. in a variety of forms, you know, whether it is your videotape or whether it's mm. your data or whether it's a publication or a, a publication on the way to a final publication. Where you see ownership of that curation? Uh, ownership. Mm. Um. Well, I'd say curation uh, clearly is important, and I think that's why repositories are clearly, you know, critical a critical development. Um, do you mean ownership in terms of if somebody leaves the institution, should their stuff still be on that institution's site, or do you mean yeah. is it at a, at a needs, deeper level than that? Take or? responsibility for ensuring that this, the outputs of this scholarly work is preserved. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I think traditional publishing model won't necessarily be sustainable. No. I think that has to be institutional rather than individual, because I think I think you know, the inst at the end, the, the, the individual is working for the institution. All the funding will go to the institution. This institution then end up in court if something goes wrong with the research. Um, so I, I I think there's an institutional responsibility there, um, working with the individual, obviously, so to to make sure that it's all all aligned. But but I think ultimately, I think yeah, there's a job there to be done um, at institutional level to make sure that that happens and. And to facilitate it through kind of effective mechanisms and systems and whatnot. I think I think we'll draw the questions to a close there, um, so we can move on. Okay. Um, Jerry, I'd like to thank you for your demonstrated our appreciation for for your participation. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Some of you still may have some questions. Um, Jerry is hoping to be able to stay through into the panel session. So if you have a question that um, occurs to you over the next hour or so that is directed at Jerry, then uh, there may still be an opportunity to ask that. So having set the scene, thank you very much, Jerry. We now want to move on to um, a panel of five of our university librarians or directors of libraries to speak from their perspectives on various aspects of these challenges. I'm just going to introduce each of them briefly. They're each then going to come up and uh, give their presentation for 10 minutes. We're going to save the questions for the panel session. So there won't be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of each section. So keep your questions in mind, note them down. Tweet them if you've got something in front of you that you can tweet with to at QLOC uh, so that they're not forgotten. First of all, um, I'd like to introduce Sandra Jeffries from the University of the Sunshine Coast. Sandra is Director of Information Services and she's not listening. <laughs> Aren't you up first? No, no, no. I'll introduce you each separate. Well, I'll do, well, I'll do them all. Okay. Then you can hand, I'll do that and it'll stop me coming up and down those steps all the time and I'm probably going to trip. So first of all, we have Sandra Jeffries from the University of the Sunshine Coast. Uh, then we're going to have Judy Stocker, who's Director of Library Services at QUT. Then Jeanette Wright, who is Chief Executive Officer and State Librarian at the, Univers at the State Library of Queensland. Bob Geraghty, University Librarian, University of Queensland, and uh, then lastly, Linda O'Brien, Pro Vice Chancellor, Information Services at Griffith University. So they can each hand over 
one to another in a streamlined fashion, except if they see me hovering at the bottom base of the stairs, they know they have to stop and move on to the next person. How's that going to go? I'm sure we can manage that. <laughs> Please um, welcome Sandra Jeffries. Thanks, Barbara. And, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about positioning our libraries for the future, but in the context of learning and teaching and undergraduates. And it's not that I, I don't think research is important, but most of the funding that comes to our institutions comes from the government based on undergraduate student load. So we need to make sure that we attract students and retain them and help them become successful. Um, I have to confess to, to maybe those younger people in the audience that we have been pondering the position of libraries and librarianship for a long time for decades, actually. Um, we, we've pondered the, the future of the profession, our own roles, how our roles might change over time. Um, and I'm not sure what that says about us as a profession. It may be that we've always been quite forward thinking, or it may just reflect our vulnerabilities. I'll leave you to decide that one. I think the difference in recent years, though, is the impact of the technological changes that have really made new things possible in terms of the way we learn, the way we access information, the way we interact with each other, the way we live. So that's, that's been a big change. The other reasonably recent change that's impacting on all of us is that need for us to demonstrate the value of what we do. And it's not just in the library space. Our institutions are expected to demonstrate their value too to society as a whole. And I think we're, when we're talking about or thinking about positioning ourselves for the future, obviously we need to have a good awareness of the context or the environment in which we are operating. Um, and that's not just the social and technological environment. It's also government requirements, the higher ed sector generally. Um, our own universities and we need to become familiar with known or identified trends but be able to make sense and meaning of those in our local context. So I'm going to talk a little bit about positioning ourselves, both our libraries and ourselves, from a regional university perspective and I'm going to focus on a couple of things, both space and our people. Which one? <laughs> Enter. Oh, this. <laughs> Thank you. You reckon? That one? That one? That's what I'm doing, that one. Okay. This is my university. It's young. It's Australia's fastest growing university in a, a very fast growing region. And it's, um, part of its vision is to be regionally relevant. We have many kangaroos and we also have students. <laughs> We've got about 9,000 of them, the students, not the kangaroos. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and we're aiming to, to have about 12,000 students by um, 2015. 77% of our students are from our own region. 50% of them are first in family. More than half are older than 21. And participation in tertiary education has more than doubled since the university opened in 1996. We also enjoy a five-star rating in the Good Universities Guide for Student Satisfaction, which I have to say is much higher than some of our metropolitan colleagues. And I'd like to think that, <laughs> that the library has some credit for that. <laughs> um, the challenge for us is to balance the need for individual face-to-face -face personalised attention because of our student cohort with being able to sustain that into the future and provide complementary services. All right, I'm going to try this again. I'll work that time. 
So first of all, positioning. What are libraries for? You know when you think about what is a library? What's its purpose? I've always thought of it as, as three main things. It provides space and facilities, it provides resources, and it provides services. I know that's really basic, but in terms of spaces and positioning us, and, and here I'm talking about physical space, not virtual space, that's a whole other issue. But for our libraries, we obviously need to provide an environment that's conducive to learning and is welcoming. And we need to get that balance between the open, flexible, group, noisy sorts of spaces and the more private, quiet, individual study spaces. I think we've gone a bit overboard in the last few years in terms of um, creating cool sorts of flexible, open spaces when increasingly over the years in surveys, our students tell us they're sick of all the noise in our libraries and they want individual quiet study spaces. The other thing I think we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about positioning our libraries is what impact do our spaces have on other learning spaces on campus and them on us. So what does the library provide that other learning spaces on campus do not provide? And I would say what we provide in the library is a certain ambience. We provide quiet space that I don't think you can get anywhere else on campus. And so it's like we provide for our students a haven, a sanctuary, somewhere where they can contemplate and reflect thoughtfully. We also, of course, provide resources and provide services. <laughs> now, in terms of services, I've deliberately not put a graphic on this slide. <laughs> But this, <coughs> this is a phrase that I came across in a report on the value of academic libraries um, in 2012 from the, uh, the US, the Association of College and Research Libraries. And it reflected the important role that library staff play in making students feel engaged and comfortable and at ease and likely to, to stay at our universities and succeed. Um, and librarians play a really key role in that in terms of the services that they provide for our students. Um, and, and we would hope because of that that we retain our students. So what sort of staff should we be recruiting as we position ourselves for the future? Obviously we need lots of probably new skills and maybe new knowledge. Um, but I think bottom line, a lot of it is going to come down to attitude. And I may have said that years ago too, it's, it's probably still true. Um, in terms of the skills that I think we'll be needing into the future, um, obviously um, the ones like technological skills so that our, our librarians can operate effectively in a blended learning environment. Um, maybe skills in curriculum design where we partner with our academic colleagues digital literacy, analytical skills, skills in digitisation, social media, etc. And also some of the research data management skills um, that have already been mentioned, bibliometrics, etc. I think we'll also need our people to have good knowledge and not just of the standard library things like resources and collections, etc. But to be aware of the implications of things like open access and other changes in scholarly publishing. Um, the possible implications of MOOCs and how we can contribute to that space. And also knowledge more broadly, so not just library knowledge, but knowledge about our institutions and about the, the higher ed sector. In terms of attitudes, I think we'll be looking for people who can look for opportunities and identify gaps and anticipate and be open to change and be proactive. And some of that, I think, means throwing off the library blinkers and being able to look at what we do with fresh eyes, almost like a stranger, to really assess the value of what we are doing. What we do well. And Jerry's um, already mentioned some of these things. I think we work well with others. We collaborate well, we partner well, we share well. And QLOC's a wonderful example of that. 
I think what we also do well and can do even better into the future is leading our institutions. And we've already seen examples of that in research data management and, and open access. And there'll be increasing opportunities, I think, in the changing online learning environments, and, and MOOCs is a nice example of that. Last couple of minutes. I love this. <laughs> I think as we look to the future, it's important to also acknowledge our past, you know, to acknowledge our history, our traditions, our professionalism, our achievements, our successes, our expertise. And that's not being complacent, because we can't afford to be complacent, but acknowledging and building on our strengths into the future. And also to keep in mind that as we consider our library futures, our institutions are also considering their futures. And what the future of universities and higher ed might be into the future as our online learning environments change. So to summarise, because no one's at the foot of the steps yet, but I, I must be close. <laughs> uh, to summarise, um, I think when we think about positioning for the future, we need to align our priorities with those of our institutions and target our activities accordingly. And they will vary from institution to institution. It's, it's all context-based. That we make sure we are aware of the broader environment in, in which we work, that we anticipate, be flexible, that we attempt to demonstrate our value, um, and most of all, along the way, that we enjoy what we do as we do it. Thank you. warned you about me, did they? I'm as good with the technology. <laughs> okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, Sandra, great uh, start to our remarks this afternoon, so um, I'm looking forward to following on some of those. So, positioning for the future. Uh, I warn you, I have no animals and there will be no mention of any intimacy in my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to focus my remarks this afternoon in two main areas and it's with respect to positioning for the future in terms of supporting research and uh, I'm, some of what I'm going to say I think uh, follows on from comments that Jerry made earlier. So the two main areas I want to talk about this afternoon are some of the new things that university libraries are already doing to support research and um, much of this won't be new to you. Um, some of you are already involved in, uh, in some of these activities, so I wanted to speak a little bit about that. And then I want to talk about, um, in order to achieve success in these areas, uh, what we need to do as libraries <coughs> in terms of the future. So first of all, around research data management services, this is an area where university libraries are starting to make uh, some inroads. Um, I recall it was about seven years ago that I was at a call event and um, one of the speakers was talking about the role that university libraries would be able to play in the future with respect to research data management and data curation. And at that time it was thought to be a new idea and we were thinking about, well, how might we be, be able to add value in that space. Since that time, we've seen several university libraries, um, both in Australia and overseas, start to develop services and infrastructure uh, in this area drafting policies, uh, writing guides around best practice for managing research data, providing consultancy services to researchers and undertaking training and also contributing to the design of infrastructure. Collaborative technology supports another area and these two first points really um, eventuate from the rise of e-research if you like. So with the development of new collaborative technologies and researchers wanting to use those, libraries have stepped into that space and provided training and support with respect to collaborative technologies and provide consultancy and advice around that. Jerry mentioned open access um, and the new publishing models and the complexity of that and the fact that it, it is confusing. Um, and we have an important role to play in that area and many of us are, are working quite a lot in that space in terms of helping academics understand issues, 
around open access, how to comply with mandates um, and how to expose their research outputs. And in the area of open access monograph publishing, yes, that is uh, an emerging area and we're hearing of new models all the time. And in fact, only last week we, I saw a presentation on Knowledge Unlatched, which is a, a new model that's coming out. Um, so it is an important area and libraries, I think, have a responsibility to be providing leadership in their institutions in this area. Research skills training. Now that's something we've always done, but we're certainly doing a whole lot more than just EndNote training these days. Um, many of us are involved in training with altmetrics, training with regard to research data management, as I mentioned before. We're training in copyright, and we've done that for a long time, but now if you go to a training course, it's likely to be copyright at the researcher and their use of social media. So we see that there's quite a lot of change in this space. Researcher portals. Now this is another really important development that university libraries can be involved in. If there's one thing we, we should be doing, and that is, I think, trying to help the researcher in terms of letting them get on with their research. And one way we can do that is to improve their online working environment. And many uh, universities are engaged in that. And um, I, in fact, was, had a colleague recently telling me how great the portal was at Griffith University uh, for researchers in terms of providing access to a range of services and resources that they need. And libraries have an important part to play in that area in terms of providing advice, design, um, and being at the table when those sorts of, um, of uh, developments are being uh, designed. At my institution, we're playing in a space which some people probably think is a little strange, and that's with respect to electronic laboratory notebook. So why is the library doing this? To be perfectly honest, nobody else picked up the ball. So it was about being aware of opportunities. So this is a project that's exploring the use of electronic notebooks in the lab. So uh, researchers use paper workbooks in their labs. It's an important part of their documentation. And uh, the electronic laboratory notebook is heavily used in industry and private research institutions. It's not so um, widespread in universities, and we're going to trial it at our university with a group of researchers. The library's involved because we play a role in information management. Um, we've got project management skills. We know the researchers, and we just seem like a logical group of people to, to undertake that project. Would we continue to run that service in the future? Maybe not but we've certainly um, got a skill set to assist with the trial. There's probably a few other things I should have on that slide. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list, but of course many of us are involved in the impact and research assessment exercises that Jerry spoke about in terms of providing bibliometric services. And recently many institutions building metadata stores, which are the metadata descriptions of research data sets to hopefully promote the discoverability and reuse of that research data. So all new and exciting and interesting areas for us to be involved in. At the same time, doing lots of all of these other things we've done for years. So some of the lessons. I think um, for libraries, moving into these new areas of research support and taking up new opportunities presents us with a sharp contrast to how we've operated in the past. Yes, some of the skill sets are the same and, uh, and our, our commitment to service is the same, but we can't be complacent in terms of how we deliver these services because there's quite a lot of um, aspects to them that, that are, are different, I think, to the way we operate now. So one size doesn't fit all. From a research point of view, there are not only disciplinary differences, but there are differences within the discipline. So as a liaison librarian, yes, you knew your discipline and you worked with different researchers um, and you had, you know, your regular services. But when you start talking to a researcher about their research data sets at the beginning of their research project, you really need to be having that dialogue over a very long period of time and get a very deep understanding of the research and how they're doing that research. So I think that that's sort of a, a ramping up of the relationship uh, from what we've had in the past. More than ever before, we need to understand our clients' needs. Um, and again, that's about that relationship and understanding the research and how they're doing the research. I think it's important that we speak their language where we can and not use our own language. Um, if, you, if you want to build that relationship, we've got to be on the same page. 
Now the third dot point for anybody from QUT Library, they're probably about to roll their eyes and groan and say, oh, here she goes again. Uh, because I have been banging on about workforce planning for about six years. But I think it's absolutely critical that we do this in university libraries. We need new skill sets, we need different staff profile, um, and we need to move forward. Now many, many libraries are doing that and they may not have it as tagged as workforce planning, but if you look at the way their profiles changed in the last few years, you can see that they have managed to get together bits and pieces of resources and created new roles. You know, we have data librarians, we have um, scholarly publications librarians, we have a whole raft of new positions and different responsibilities. And if we look across all of the university libraries in this country and we looked at those roles, I think you'd find quite a significant change over the last five years. And I think it's also about skilling our folk up so they've got the confidence and the skills required to work in a much deeper level in the research environment. In terms of collaboration, we've heard that term mentioned a few times this afternoon. Um, and there's quite an emphasis for the researchers to collaborate, but we need to collaborate. And this is another area where I've, I have spoken about this on a few occasions. Um, there's a model called the three C's, which talks about communication, cooperation and collaboration. And the most difficult of those three C's is the collaboration. Because to have true collaboration, you need to share the goals. You need to let go of your own turf and have a common turf. And that's quite difficult to do, but it's absolutely essential if we want to have success in this sort of uh, service context. Um, this isn't just our business anymore. If you're working on a, an infrastructure for managing research data, you need to be working with the IT folk. And in fact, they are going to be, uh, should be joined at the hip uh, with the library in terms of the development of some of these services. And it's not only the IT, it's the Office of Research, it's the faculties, it's the research institutes. So in terms of thinking about the people of the future, um, I would add that they absolutely need to be the sort of people who can collaborate um, and who, know, who are the sort of folk that don't get into the turf war and that's, that can be challenging. And finally, we need to ha be agile, we need to be flexible and we need to move more quickly than we have in the past. The context is changing, it's changing rapidly and we absolutely need to be able to deliver a new service uh, in less than a 12 month period and without it having to go to six library committees mm -hmm. and have several, several proposals. So we need to be able to move fast, um, speak the language and be able to deliver. So um, with that, um, I'll leave you with one uh, final comment and that it won't be, it's not one size fits all for researchers and it won't be one size fits all for university libraries either. A lot of this is context specific. So in your own organisation, you will have your own particular structures, you'll have your own personalities, you'll have your own processes and committees and you, we won't find that every university library is going to be doing all of these things. It will vary from institution to institution. The trick is to look for the opportunities and grab them when they come along. Thanks. Well, I'm Jeanette Wright and my voice has gone on holiday today, so forgive me for it being a bit bit croaky <clears throat> and it may give out in the middle of all this and I've got lots of uh, slides but I'm going to flip through them so somebody yell at me when I've done my 10 minutes please. Um, I was asked to talk about um, st uh, st strategy and how we're doing uh, strategic development at the State Library and uh, this um, this wheel represents our strategic objectives that we have been working with for a couple of years now and will for a couple more. And uh, it was based on some really extensive consultation with public libraries, local government, um, people around the state. Um, so the four things we're trying to do, up, you know, we're, we're enriching the lives of all Queenslanders. So with our budget, we're trying to reach everyone in Queensland. And 
our four strategic objectives are to improve access to library services, and that might seem a very mundane thing, but when you're thinking about Indigenous children on Cape York or people who don't have uh, language skills, these are quite big barriers, and so we, we have a lot of programs in place specifically for that. And we're working to co-create Queensland's memory because, as you know, a state library has responsibility for the documentary heritage of the state. But it also, we think, in Queensland has responsibility for capturing the oral traditions, particularly the traditions of the Indigenous peoples here in Queensland. So that is a big task as well. And the third one is extend learning and creative experiences. And that's really um, about engaging with communities and showcasing a lot of our collections and content and working with communities to engage them, to get them on, come on site. We have about one and a half million visitors on site each year, but many more online. So we suspect the online is growing at a faster rate than the, than the physical visits. And the fourth one, which is probably what I spend most of my time on as the state librarian, is develop our people and capability. And that's a lot around uh, developing our corporate culture and our skill base for dealing with a lot of challenges, but also working in the resources area, because as you know, we are funded by the state government and 92% of our budget comes straight out of the state but government coffers. And the rest, we uh, do our best to increase uh, our resources from philanthropy, so I spend a lot of time talking to high net worth individuals, from uh, partnerships, uh, particularly things like the business activities and the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame, and also through other some commercial activities, although I always see the commercial activities as something around the edge of our core business, which is a public good and which needs to be provided to people uh, without uh, charge. So uh, just I will try and move on quickly now. We've decided that um, we have begun a, a new process of looking at our planning and the first thing we want to do is engage our, our stakeholders in a question around purpose because we know that the changes out there are impacting on, a, on how people are using the, the state library and the local public libraries and we're asking people what do they think they would want to be doing in the state library in 2020 for instance. And this, this graphic shows the map we've uh, planned for our consultation, which really runs over two years. But it includes a new board that we're expecting to be announced any day soon, um, local, government, local government associations, public librarians around the state, um, the users who come in off the street, everybody need to be engaged in this process. And one of the things we did a few months back was kick off a, a, a social media campaign called Why Library. And if you want to check that out, you can um, search on Twitter for hashtag Why Library. And you'll see that people all over the world are now contributing to our discussion. And when I tested this out at IFLA, I, I got the very clear response that this was a question about what are we here for? What do we do? Why would anyone think we're worthwhile? And that's exactly the question we need to answer. So as part of this, we uh, recently held a seminar um, at the State Library and we had uh, three speakers, Eli Nieberger, who's the Associate Director of IT and Production at Ann Arbor District Library, Simon Groth from IF Book Australia and one of our directors, Jane Cowell, who's the Director of Regional Access and Public Libraries. And you can see on the on your left there, um, Paul Barclay, who facilitated that discussion. And they talked a lot about the possible futures and impacts for libraries, given in the changes in publishing and technology, with audience members and people following the discussion via the live stream and Twitter joining the conversation. This is a, a sh another shot of Eli, who was actually on his way to a conference at Lianza. We never miss an opportunity to grab someone else's keynote speakers if they're going past. Now, he, he put up a slide that uh, was really trying to answer the question about what do we do. And I, th I, I just thought, you, this is memorable. We share shit. Shit you want, shit you need, shit you made, and plus, you can shit here. 
So uh, we thought that was a pretty broad brush approach to what our purpose could be. The uh, other thing that we've been working, of course, is that we don't just look at what the State Library is doing in South Bank. We look at uh, how people are accessing library services right across the state. And this is an image of um, Barku Shire Council's library. And it is, it's the cover of, of this uh, little booklet called The Next Horizon Vision 2017 for Queensland Public Libraries. Now, this was a statewide consultation with a lot of the stakeholders. And it really comes up with Queensland Public Libraries, spaces to learn, work and create. And it actually gives guidance for four different types of activities, from everything from connecting in the physical and virtual space, to technology trendsetters, to being a place for innovation and ideas. And so that's a guidebook for all of us working in the public library space. The other thing we do when we're researching people who use the library is we use the culture segments uh, research, which is done by Morris Hargrave and McIntyre. And you, won't, you can't see the detail here, but you could see that um, it's dividing the people who use the library up into different lifestyle segments. And it samples five and a half thousand adults, that is over 16 year olds in Australia, based on their cultural values and their motivations and their beliefs, their attitudes. And, it, and we're also, we know that Australians spend nearly $12 billion a year on arts, culture and heritage. Now, not a lot of that's spent on libraries because the library services are free. But we do know that there's a very big demand for services in this space. And we need to identify the people that are coming to the State Library as to whether they're coming for entertainment or enrichment or stimulation or release. These are the characteristics of the kinds of people that we can address. And when we do that, that makes it easy for us to develop strategies around what services we offer them. Now, the other thing I promised that I would do today was just quickly talk about uh, how we co collaborate with the other state libraries and the two national libraries in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, this is the group called National and State Libraries Australasia, and it has every state library, every territory library and the two national libraries as members. And we don't need to compete because we have very clear jurisdictions, so we're not in the same position as University Library. But um, about seven or eight years ago, NASLA, as we call it, uh, came up with a strategic plan called Reimagining Libraries. And it developed a huge number of uh, projects that we all share in. And those projects are jointly funded. And uh, for an example, there's a, a project uh, called um, digital collecting and these are all grouped together under the objective of one library and digital collecting um, is the NSLA contribution to SLQ to fund a project manager so we actually have a person that's paid for by NASLA working in the State Library of Queensland and that person leads the others in the other uh, you, uh, the other state libraries to develop definitions, status reports, audits, emerging trends, drivers, standards, recommendations, particularly in the space of the born digital capture and long-term preservation. So that's just an example of how we can cooperate and get way more value than if we each try to do that ourselves. So the three strategies in the NASLA plan are all of those projects listed under one library and uh, that includes, for instance, some digitising. But another one called Enabling People, which covers things like communi community created content, issues around copyright and literacy and learning, that we're all working in those spaces. Another one, um, another grouping is called Accessible Content. And that's where we're trying to develop standards and agree on storage and collecting so that we're not duplicating work in each of the states. So you can see that we get a lot, of, lot more benefit from being part of NASLA and we meet three times a year, that is the CEOs meet three times a year and we get more benefit from that than each of us trying to work out standards for digital preservation 
or working out how we're going to capture um, online content or how we're going to describe and make discoverable the maps or large picture collections or any of the other things. Okay, I've, I've run out of time, so I'll wind up. I had just here um, mention of the IFLA trend report. Any of you who haven't seen that, I uh, recommend you go on to the IFLA site and have a quick look. Um, I thought what I would do if I'd had more time was talk about new and future roles. Clearly, uh, we're working in the space of Indigenous knowledge centres, and this is a lovely picture of an example of kids in one of the Indigenous knowledge centres. Um, this is Hope Vale. Um, and uh, that's a space where we're helping. We pay this half of the salaries for Indigenous people to coordinate those services. And we're now developing training programs which are coordinated and integrated with uh, uh, more professional programs. The other one I wanted to mention was particularly the maker spaces. And you'd be aware of the edge at the State Library. And that's a place where we have 3D printing. This is an example of one of our earlier 3D printers. This one's a more up-to-date one. This is the MakerBot. And so in summary, I would say, just, just like we do, that for you, you'd need to be thinking about consultation, connecting, and in our case, that's connecting with users, intergenerational users, regional and distributed collections, collaborate with local government, with education, you, and other partnerships. And certainly from our perspective, we see our future is co-creating, move up the value chain of publishing, commissioning, editing, producing, and distribution. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Bob Garrity from UQ, and Jeanette, before I start, I need to know, are there going to be bumper stickers for We Share Shit? <laughs> so I thought I'd take um, a slightly different approach um, from the point of view that really the future is now. As Sandra said, we've been talking, we always talk about the future, um, but in many ways the future is here now. We live in a, a highly networked, highly digital world and have been for years, and I think more importantly, students coming into uni were born into that world, so it's all that they know. So I thought I'd look briefly at uh, two themes, one being the user experience, and really it's the student user experience, and then provide some examples of where we're still operating, um, I think at a local level um, and not at a network level or a web level. Um, and the second example uh, where I think we're better positioned, representing positioning libraries did 10 or 12 years ago, um, which is really institutional repositories and how we can build on some of the successes there. So this is a, a slide we got from a usability study we recently did of our website. Um, and it included a number of tasks that we wanted students to do, thinking about how they might use the library. And one of the things libraries provide is information about how to do uh, referencing, different styles of referencing. Um, so the task was to find information about APA referencing style, but we didn't tell them where to begin. So naturally, they went to Google. Um, and some students would add a UQ after the search, um, but many didn't. Um, and in this case, the first result that appeared uh, was APA referencing guide from University of Southern Queensland. Now I'm University of Queensland. Um, students response was this will do just fine. Um, and we <laughs> and I'm sure that's why it's number one. <laughs> but we've gone to the effort to create our own um, and ideally if we're creating effort we want people to use that. So a real question of why are we still doing this, everyone doing this locally when that's not how users approach uh, finding information. Um, so another example of this, and uh, certainly one of our strategies is to focus on areas where we're distinct from other libraries. Subject guides is not one of those areas. So we're all doing these. Uh, I picked accounting here and just picked screenshots from um, four subject guides. Uh, they're largely the same. Uh, many of the resources we get are the same. It strikes me that there's a real opportunity for collaboration and cooperation around creation of subject guides. Students go, don't go to the library looking for subject help. 
In fact, the response we got was they would expect this to be in Blackboard associated with a, a course. Um, so they're unlikely to discover subject guides the way you know, we create content. So we really need to look at how they create content and uh, ways to achieve efficiencies around things like that. I think another thing we do is really uh, underestimate the value of convenience um, for our users. Uh, and this is a screenshot from uh, Harvard's catalog, and they have a, what they call a scan and deliver service that was introduced uh, several years ago. Many libraries in North America do this. Um, but really, uh, it's sort of the last mile where all of the, most of the collections we buy now are in digital form. We're aggressively purchasing back sets. And yet, if we hold something in print at a location that a student is near, we say you need to come to the library to pull this off the shelf and make a photocopy or scan. Why not just provide a scan service and deliver that content in the way that they expect? Um, so at UQ, we'll be introducing a similar kind of service very shortly, um, but really delivering information in the way that our students expect. Uh, another thing is um, what Lorcan Dempsey calls full library discovery where we've all invested in discovery systems that sit on top of our catalog um, and also provide article content, but they really do nothing to expose library expertise. Um, so how do we make library expertise or other library services part of that library discovery experience? And this is a screenshot from uh, University of Michigan's catalog where after your simple search, um, you'll not only get databases and article content appropriate to the search, but you'll also get uh, links to librarians who uh, are connected to whatever subject you happen to be searching. So really exposing other sorts of services with the library discovery, um, as well as providing suggestions for if you haven't found what you're looking for, other places to go, um, or recommendations based on content you found. Uh, I think space as a service is another important thing, and Sandra talked a bit about this. Um, this takes the, and it, and it relates to uh, the point about coffee and library. Um, this is Stanford University, so they, like all of us, have invested heavily in creating uh, wonderful learning spaces, um, but have built a nice filter in their website. So if you want a study space where there's coffee nearby um, or that has power, it has a number of filters. Um, so you can drill down and find the study space that's closest to what you're actually looking for. And like Sandra, in all the uh, surveys we've done, it really is quiet study space that they're looking for most often. So another way to discover space. Um, and then as uh, good librarians with uh, cataloging their spaces, they've uh, provided nice attributes so you can easily tell um, what it's like if you haven't been there before. Uh, so moving on to the what I think is a real success story. Um, you know, we've been investing in repositories for 10 or more years. Uh, I think from uh, UQ's perspective, we built a very large repository in the recent uh, ranking of web repositories. We, we're now number 14 on the world list. And unfortunately, at number nine, we have another Queensland institution. Um, so we need to work out how to, how to yeah, game the rankings. Um, but we have built a very large institutional asset in the form of data about university research outputs um, and have spent a lot of time leveraging that and really establishing the repository as the core system, the source of truth, if you will, um, for research outputs for the university. Uh, and we can leverage that to do a lot of other things. Um, Here's an example where the university in another website, UQ Researchers, which is managed by the research office, they actually pull the metadata from our eSpace repository into their system. Um, also the example, we have lots of departments and schools and even individual researchers who will query eSpace to pull accurate, um, updated, authoritative information about publications. Uh, more recently with uh, data management and data curation, we've added the ability to uh, describe data sets in the eSpace, and if it's a small data set, to actually deposit it in eSpace, and are working now to uh, identify appropriate storage solutions for larger data sets so um, researchers can come to eSpace as a place where they uh, describe and deposit, even if it's not directly with us, their data, and we will curate that over time. Uh, also mention of metrics, uh, so obviously we provide um, citation counts and other download statistics about uh, articles 
described in eSpace and more recently have added belt metrics um, as another way to provide information but also help foster discussions with researchers on campus about what, what these mean. Um, so really the, it's a, a platform that allows uh, interaction um, with researchers, uh, it helps us build a relationship with the uh, Office of Research uh, and also the UQ executive who rely on eSpace um, for reporting about UQ publication patterns and collaborations and other things. It's just an example of where Altmetrics takes you. Um, so really the point just being, you know, I think a lot of us invested heavily many years ago in positioning uh, repositories as a future, a key future direction for academic libraries, and I do think that's starting to pay off. Uh, I'll leave it there, and Linda, you're last. Thank you. Sandra began by reminding us that have been around for a while that for a long time we've been pondering the future of the profession and the future of the library. And I was reminded of being a, a relatively uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed librarian uh, about 25 years ago when Arnett was about to hit, hit our shores. Um, at the time, I was immensely excited about the potential it brought, but it certainly also fueled a whole lot of discussions, including one where I happened to be fortunate enough to be at call not long after Arnett had hit the streets, where a, a, a very grey-haired librarian stood up and said, um, I've discovered that my staff are emailing staff in other universities. Um, and comparing how they go about you know, acquiring items or whatever it was, and this was terrible. You know, all communication <laughs> should come through my office. Um, <laughs> and it was a signature moment for me in understanding that amazing cultural divide between my place at the time as, as a, a freshly minted uh, and excited librarian and those that have been here for a while and the way in which they viewed the world. And uh, I, I fear that I'm in danger of being in that grey head category um, right now. But for me, it still excites me, uh, the changes that we see around ourselves everywhere. And, and over those years, I've had many a conversation with the Vice Chancellor about why do we need a library if it isn't everything free on the internet now. Um, and, and most recently with my own Vice Chancellor, so when you don't have any more books in the library, uh, what makes a library different than the coffee shop that Jerry talked about? <laughs> um, because you can bring coffee into a library, um, at least in ours you can. Um, so what will differentiate the space as a learning space? Um, and it's a very interesting question. Uh, it, there's no doubt that things have changed significantly and uh, I was just sent some comparative stats today. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Lynette. Um, about 10 years ago, we loaned twice as many books, yet we had 23% uh, less students than we have now at Griffith. Um, yet last year, uh, compared to our 400,000 odd loans, um, we had almost 4 million digital e-resource downloads. Um, that's a very different landscape in that time. Uh, and at the same time, we're buying about five times the number of journals. They don't sit on our shelves and we don't really own them, um, but we do have access to them for about a third more of the money. So the world is changing. Undoubtedly, the predictors of doom and gloom uh, weren't quite right, but in fact, some things are moving away and other things are growing in importance. And we had some good examples from Judy of some of the new things, the new spaces we're inhabiting, um, research data management, new publishing models. Uh, Bob talked about repositories, a space we've been in, but the repository he described wasn't the one that we set up when we first started thinking about repositories. And no doubt there'll be even more profound change if we cast forward. And I think um, Jerry's opening was a great way of framing some of those changes through a scholar's eyes and how that world is changing. And for me, I was 
busily thinking about, well, what does this challenge us to think about? How might we respond to this changing context? Um, and indeed, future success is not premised on current success. Uh, the fact that you're doing well now does not mean you'll do well in the future. Um, and as Sandra said, it's time to take the blinkers off. It's always time to take the blinkers off. And that's why I try really hard not to be that grey-haired librarian that I heard those years ago, uh, lamenting a world uh, that no longer exists. Um, because we do have to question everything around us. And, and Bob had some great examples, subject guides. Um, and the way in which we think about our craft as professionals. We do need to understand what our core competencies and capabilities are and, and how we apply our understanding of the complex world of information, of navigating it, of managing it, of mining it, and, and bring that value to bear in an increasingly complex environment. For me, the future success of our profession rests on people. Um, indeed, in the future, learning spaces may be of many kinds of which libraries are one, as is the case now, and increasingly it might become difficult to differentiate um, what's a library and what's a learning space and, and what are the boundaries between them. I think it's actually the people that will make the difference. Um, Jerry challenges very much to consider how and where we add value, um, how we position our universities at the leading edge. Sandra talked about academic intimacy, probably not a term that I'm going to adopt at Griffith. Um, it does have interesting overtones. Um, Judy uh, suggested we look for opportunities and grab them, something that I've often been accused of doing. And, uh, I get lessons in learning how to say no from many people. Um, Jeanette talked about connect, I didn't get all of these, connect, consult, collaborate, co-create, um, which really uh, echoes with me. I think at the end of the day, it is about how we partner. I think it's about stepping up. It's about that, that leading in our domain of expertise and partnering with our scholars, our, our students. And, and Jerry uh, explained uh, in his presentation about that, that changing nature of the role of the scholar and the student as a co-creator, in essence. In term, I mean, that's always been so in the research space, but increasingly we're seeing in the undergraduate space an interest in how that's built into the, the process of education. And we need to step into that space and start to demonstrate how we can add the value of our expertise and partner in the scholarly communication process. At the end of the day, uh, it's up to us to create our future value. It's the doom or gloom or nirvana is really within our control. We're the ones that can rethink what a librarian means and how that gives value back to our institutions. But it will mean letting go of some things um, and doing them differently. Uh, and maybe subject guides is a good one to start with. Um, and thinking about how we collaborate, and again, that was a common theme from, from Jerry's presentation right through, how we partner in different ways um, with different sorts of entities. The research office was mentioned by Bob. Um, to actually deliver that value. So I guess I'd encourage you to think about what you can do differently uh, when you go back to your institution um, to reconsider how you're adding value to your university's outcomes and, and what that looks like and how you bring your capabilities to bear in doing that because that's what will create the positive future um, for our profession. Uh, rather than the, the fear that uh, we'll no long, longer need libraries because it's all on the internet. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for a very good summation. There you go. You dropped your phone. Um, 
Thank you, Linda, for a very good summation. Uh, I'd like to invite not the, the <coughs> university librarians and director of the State Library who've just spoken, but also all of the university librarians who are here from QLOC to step up onto the stage now uh, for the question and answer session. You've had some very stimulating You've had some very stimulating uh, presentations from a number of a number of um, your senior colleagues, and um, and Jerry is still here. So, uh, if there are any questions that you still have um, tucked away to uh, ask Jerry, please um, please bring those forward. And in fact, uh, and we actually do have a Twitter a tweet. <laughs> on the Twitter feed. Um, Jerry, you said everyone wants to start a journal. Do, uh, please elaborate. Libraries are starting journal and monograph e-presses. Is this valued? Um, is it valued? I think, um, I think sometimes it's valued. I think, um, uh, I think the issue behind it is the one I referred to, which is from the researcher's point of view, um, they need to know that the um, they need to know that where they're publishing their work is going to um, firstly hit the audience that they want to hit, and I think in some situations where you have um, uh, kind of in-house type publications or, or publications springing up all over the place, it's difficult to read what the re what the readership of that output will be, um, as opposed to perhaps more well-established um, outputs. Um, and I think the, um, I guess the other question is, from a researcher's point of view, is if I publish in this particular outlet, will it, will it kind of bring me any reputational gain? Because actually it's all about reputation at the end of the day in terms of your standing within your research community. And I think again, that's a difficult one for researchers to, to especially early career researchers, to really grasp, I think. And so um, I, I, I've, I've, I can see why e-publishing is proliferating. I understand it, and I can, you know, it makes makes sense from one point of view, but I think it, it really makes for a very confusing landscape from the point of view of uh, researchers, and particularly career researchers. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you, Jerry. Please, if you're asking a question, um, give your name and your institution, and if you want to direct your question to a particular university librarian or director of the state library, please say that as well. And the university librarians and the director of the state library are allowed to ask questions too. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Sue from the University of the Sunshine Coast and it's for Jerry again, another question. I just would like you to um, to talk more about the, the metrics, the value-added metrics, because the humanities and the social sciences are the people I work with. And I'm used to doing the impact factors and things like that from like web of science and having things as a number, but to have something value-added, could you just elaborate on that a bit more? Um, yeah, well, I'm not sure I have a straightforward answer to that. I think, um, I think from the humanities and social sciences, I think the way I read it is that a lot of those, I mean, there's plenty of impact factors and citation information there. Um, I think the the problem is a lot of that takes a long time to, to differentiate stuff that really is very influential in the field from stuff that just doesn't really have much of a much of a, an impact within the subject area. Um, and so I think I think it's it's I think it is a real challenge actually to know what to do with that information with with lots of researchers and social science humanities and like I said before, the, you know when the UK thought about bringing this into its research evaluation, it decided not to do it in those areas because it couldn't really see the value in in, in bringing those measures to bear uh, in terms of assessing the quality of the outputs people had produced. Um, so I think so I think there's a way to go yet before people really understand how to, how to um, really make use of all that information that's there. Um, I suspect 
I suspect some of the, um, the kind of tracking mechanisms now are going to be quite interesting. So I think it is of interest to people if they, so say they put a, 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 a journal article out there to see, you know, who, well, first it's very interesting to see who's citing it. It's interesting to see who's talking about it. So, you know, the whole altmetrics thing around finding out who's blogging about it or commenting about it, I think is really useful. Um, so I think that I can see the value in that. Um, but, uh, yeah, like I said, I think, I think there's still quite a long way to go before, before we've, we've really got a, a good sense of how to use that information within within those particular areas. Um, yeah, I think that's probably all I can say really about response. Thank you. Um, hi, Nicole Clark from QT Library. Um, Judy, your comment about um, the need to identify and seize um, opportunities resonated with me, and many of the speakers touched on that as well. What I'm interested in is um, in the advocacy and political skills that you think are needed um, in this environment to convince others within the organisation that we're the people to take up those roles. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, please? Um, you just reminded me of something I forgot to say. <laughs> Um, I was thinking about that driving in this morning. Uh, I think that we need to be um, very skilled in, in advocacy and it's an area where we, we will need to develop our skills because in the past um, there's a view that people knew what the library did and, and valued it. But as we move into new areas, we've got to have that three minute elevator speech um, pretty well worked out. And um, I can remember being at an e-research conference about five years ago and talking to a researcher about, you know, the possibility of libraries being involved in research data management. And this particular researcher looked horrified and said, why would you want to have anything to do with that? Uh, so um, I think that we've got quite a big job ahead of us. And yes, we will need to be skilled in terms of advocacy and, and manoeuvring in that political environment. Um, which is our university. I might just add to that, it's a really good question. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about is the, the changing role of the librarian from being someone you went to to get help. Because often when you ask an academic about why they value us, it's, oh, well, when I've exhausted every other way to find what I need, I just ring and, you know, they can find it for me. <laughs> Um, and, and that's, you know, whilst that's playing an important role, it's much more about how you're there on the front foot so that they're not having to ring and say, I can't, I can't do this. Um, how are you buddying up so that they're developing the capability, have the tools, can see the value you can bring? How do you can get that higher order value? And, and I think we underestimate the value we can bring. And so part of that is, being better advocates, understanding the value that we can bring and then being out there and actually doing the elevator speech and saying, well, actually, we can help you with that. Because I think often, um, you know, working in, a, in, a, in an organisation, we have both IT and libraries. Um, li librarians are always undervalued um, and, and people are very happy with what they get when they could get so much more, whereas IT, it's, it's never enough. Um, so how do we actually switch that around? How do we be seen to be of much more value as we are and make sure that that's used wisely? If I could just uh, add to that too, I think that's where the, um, the collaboration uh, comes in because in forming collaborative partnerships uh, amongst ourselves and, and with um, academic staff, I think that it's uh, easier for librarians to get across what their value is they can start to contribute to the overall effort of whatever the collaboration is. And that's where the real value in, in collaborating, it's part, it's, it's a style perhaps of um, uh, advocacy, but it's, it's a way of getting into the communities that we are trying to work with and to raise our profile where we want to raise our profile. I could add to that a little bit more. I've been writing down some, some thoughts about this advocacy business. And I think it's a matter of getting, um, of walking in, in, our, in our clients and our users' shoes. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a trite 
cliche and you hear it in all, all other ways. But the way we can help them and provide and add value is to know what their needs are at the deepest level that we possibly can. It's something that I think many of us do. Um, it's, a lot, it's something that I think we always need to be and we could be an awful lot better at it. Um, I see a particular role for the faculty librarians in this, uh, whatever you want to call yourself. Um, as, um, and the, the concepts of embedding um, into um, research projects, into um, um, teaching and learning design teams, um, into en anywhere where our users are themselves, I think is really important and, and we mustn't forget that. Um, I'll just add to that as well. And, and I'm really showing my age here because I remember a question like that some years ago at one of these forums. So it's like we, I don't think we've solved the issue yet. Um, I, I think it's increasingly important that um, in terms of demonstrating our value, we're able to, to have some really strong documented evidence. And that might be trying to tie some of what we do to student retention, for example, or other key research outputs of the institution, or whatever it is, whatever makes sense and is of value to our institutions, that we align strategically with that and have the evidence there so that it's, you know, it's just, here it is, and it's, um, and it's obvious and, and uncontestable. Hello, Sue Hutley from QT Library. I'm gonna ask a question again along the advocacy line. Uh, especially with Jeanette here. I've seen, I guess, a few motherhood uh, recommendations recently, like academic libraries should put pressure on publishers to give us better deals, um, and how should we be working with the publishers on making access easier, um, all of the many and varied things. And I wondered if you could comment on how you see Australian libraries working together on that advocacy. Thanks, Sue. Um, I don't think we've got the answer to that yet, but I, I know that, you know, I, well, my belief is that the publishing model as it's been for the last 50 years is really breaking down and publishers are not responding very well to that. And when you think about small publishers and Australian publishers, that's especially true. Um, I think when we're talking across the country trying to persuade publishers to allow public libraries access to e-books, we're having a really tough time persuading them that, that in fact people who are accessing e-books are then just as likely to then spend money on buying more from them. But that's not something that, I mean, and that's an old argument. I do remember back in the 90s working in New South Wales and the state government changed the Libraries Act because they were being pressured by some of the video stores and the news agents because they thought that public libraries providing free access to magazines and videos was destroying their business model. What they didn't understand was their business model was broken anyway. So I think there's, that they're looking for a scapegoat and they've decided that the libraries are, particularly public libraries, are the scapegoat. But I think that there's now an increasing uh, trend to self-publishing and certainly in the academic environment, open access, which means that more and more materials are outside of the traditional publishing model. And that's why I say that we should be in there commissioning work, we should be editing, um, distributing, producing, co-creating with creators, whatever they, you know, whatever their interests, whether they're publishing fiction novels or whether they're scientific uh, articles. I think we as libraries can climb up that value chain and get much more involved. I think for, you know, a hundred years or several hundred years, we've just sat back and passively received what the publishing industry has, has produced for us. And we've, we've not even been particularly critical of that. So I think the time's changed and we need to get involved. Thanks, Jeanette. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Another question here.
Janice Nopke from Southern Cross University. I'm a health sciences librarian. Um, I'd just like to add a bit further to that discussion because um, I think we definitely do need more advocacy. Um, I'm just, I get a little bit embarrassed sometimes by the resistance that I experience to um, the library resources, um, particularly e-book models by publishers with their name starting with E, um, in, which, in which people really, it's not open access, it's not true access, you know, you've got your chapter or even less than a chapter and after that you can't read it for another month. And I think things, you know, models like that are really put off for students. And for some reason recently, with the discovery layer models, my people can't find journals anymore. And they say, and they just um, want to desert this for Google. So I, th I, I think we've got a way to go yet to make our, um, our uh, work resources truly discoverable. That's all I've got to say. Anybody can comment who likes it. I'll respond. Um, I think that it is a moving um, environment at the moment and there are some quite serious risks. We're seeing in the university sector, for example, e-books that are licensed to students but not to the library. Uh, so, and, and uh, various vendors picking off the faculties one by one and, you know, signing licence agreements with faculties and not coming anywhere near the library. Uh, so, I think there are some risks. I think we need to, and Call is already working in this area in terms of sharing information um, and uh, has, has had a paper commissioned. Um, so we need, as a, as a group, to be uh, quite aware of what's happening and working on it. Um, and it's an area that we, we need to pay some serious attention. I might just add another risk to that that came up at the search committee yesterday. Um, this was brought up in the context of um, high degree research student applicants and having very impressive publication records. Um, but when they looked at the geology and the um, biosciences or whatever the journal title was, which was highly reputable, in fact, this was a dodgy one um, out of uh, probably India with a different ISSN. So um, the predatory publishers are certainly alive and well. So there are many hazards out there for the scholar um, and, and you know, as someone from our research I just quite rightly pointed out, it's not just the hazard for the early career researcher or the, or the person trying to judge the quality of that student, it's, it's those reputable academics who put their name down to be on an editorial board not understanding what they were signing up to um, and then being associated with a predatory publisher who's behaving quite badly. So. There are many hazards out there. Uh, it's a much more complex environment. So from my perspective, that makes this even more important and, and means that we must be much, need to be much more intimate with our academics um, so that we're helping them understand the, the hazards of the environment um, that they're in. One of the things that um, the Kirok Librarian, University Librarians had our business meeting this morning, and one thing that was fairly obvious from the conversations we were having with each other is that at almost every university, um, the openness agenda is becoming much, much more influential and more needed by everybody. Um, so on one side, while we're, we're battling with publishers and trying to get better deals and um, better access models and all sorts of things at that side, we're also trying to, to advocate and, and push open models for publication, for um, for creative license um, um, creation and licensing, um, for open data and a whole stack of other open agendas, and and that's a place where librarians I think have got a are, are in a really good place to be able to influence both sides of the story. Any questions? Thank you, Heather Todd from the University of Queensland. I was just wondering about the impact of MOOCs that, um, has anybody sort of had an impact on their libraries from the general public who are doing MOOCs and then can't access the data? And I was wondering, Jeanette, whether they're starting to come to the state library or public libraries asking for that type of information to support the MOOC course. 
Well, we haven't had a significant trend yet, although we expect that will happen. And it's allied to something else I was intending to talk about, which is um, the idea of co-working centres. And these are, I mean, the state government's actually uh, set up a pilot to test out having state government workers not come into the CBD, but actually go to a local commercial co-working space. And they're actually prepared to pay for them to sit and work in those centres. And they've recognised that the Public Library Network and the State Library in the Edge are the other places where that can happen. And I would have thought there will be a big demand, not just from consultants, state government workers and, and other people, but there are going to be students. Um, universities, are stu I mean, um, what is it? The Open University will have students in, in all of the capital cities and they will want to use uh, resources but they'll also want spaces. And so we expect that there will be a demand but we haven't seen that trend yet. I suppose I'll just make a quick comment. Um, Charles Darwin University launched this week its first MOOC we're a bit slow, slower than other people. Um, it's a very specialised MOOC about Charles Darwin, the scientist, and uh, his role and in evolution. Um, it is going to be very specialised. It's going to be very um, short and specific. And the issue of access to other resources at the moment is being handled by the development of open educational resources. So in the hope that in order to do this MOOC, they will have access to all the information that they need on open access. And if we're developing, we are developing quite a few resources around it, quite a few learning objects, and they're going to be available on open access. How sustainable that is going to be in the long run, um, we just don't know. I think, I think MOOCs is a movable feast in a way. Um, it, it's a really new area for all of us, and I think it's perhaps tech, and it's all a bit by surprise. Um, is it sustainable? Um, we don't know. We have to wait and see. Could I add another comment to this, this whole question about um, collaborative and support for, I guess, the um, remote student? And that is that we are unable to... We, we subscribe to online databases for everyone in Queensland. But clearly, we don't have the resources that even one of you has. And so we're not really able to provide the depth of content that would make it feasible for students to access that content through public libraries or through the state library. But if we could collaborate with the university sector in Queensland, I'm sure we could very easily. Thanks, Jeanette. Bill B. Got it now. Um, just following up on what Jeanette said about the, the access to content, we've talked about the cooperation and the future of um, researchers working across from a number of institutions. Sitting up on the stage, institutions run from you know, a lot of resources through to not so many. It's obvious in those collaborative, collaborative um, research projects that some researchers from some institutions are, for want of a better word, bleeding information across to others, which would appear to be in breach. State Libraries um, is unable to support students, but it's the researchers. We need to have a different model. We need to have something like the English have got to ensure that if we're going to move ahead, that we're going to allow the researchers in this country to get the access, not just via Doctel, but quickly across the same types of resources. Thoughts? been talking to a few academics lately about their areas of research um, and, and Jerry talked about the web page. For researchers that are well established in their field, they just contact the other researchers um, and the library is often irrelevant to that conversation because they know who are the leaders and they just go direct and, and there's every chance they've actually met them um, but certainly they're very open to sharing their papers. I think that's a fair assessment. It's probably the high degree research students that are at most at risk in this space because they don't have the same networks, they don't have those same privileges and certainly whatever we can do to improve the lock for them is a good thing. 
Um, I guess it's whether we're past the days of collaborative purchasing, though, and whether, in fact, the game's a different game now, and it is about the open, and it is about encouraging um, all scholars to think about how they license their material to make it accessible, and then how we provide ways in which they can readily find it. Um, that's not to say we shouldn't try, but I guess that the time when publishers are feeling They're already very defensive about our relationship with the public libraries accessing content that we buy on behalf of Queenslanders. So yeah, it's, a, it's an uphill battle persuading publishers to come to that party. Other comments on that one? Other questions? I had another one on tw um, Twitter. It's probably already been answered. Um, in an era of collaboration, how can we share commercially licensed resources with external collaborators? And I think that's already been touched on a little bit. Mm. Um, I don't know if there's anything else further to say on that one. Mm. No, I, I think that's been covered. Does anyone want to add anything? Mm. Um, Joanna Richardson, Griffith University. I Kind of going back to um, a comment that Professor Doherty made at the beginning, which was then um, uh, addressed partially, I think, by Bob Garrity, and that's the one about I want to have everything on my <laughs> on my web page, and I just and following on from Linda's comment, well, if I know the researcher, I will just go to their web page, and I want to find that content. And leaving aside from the copyright perspective, the examples I've seen at universities not a hundred kilometers from here where in fact the full papers that are actually on the, pub, on the um, academic's webpage or researcher's webpage actually contravene the um, author's agreement that they have with the publisher. <laughs> How did we discover that? <laughs> anyway, um, interesting conversations when you go and talk about the Institute of Repository. And then Bob's perspective and really Linda about the curation side. So I've been thinking about that and thinking and looking at, at because it was actually a valid point I thought that um, Professor Doherty was making and Linda's followed up there too about it's about presentation. How are we from from say an academic or researcher's perspective such as Professor Doherty, what he wants is some place where when someone lands there they have everything they need to find including the full text. Research gate, but I didn't say it. No, not research gate. <laughs> In other words something that is legal where people actually <laughs> have done the right thing and looked at the copyright. And I think it's about presentation. It is about the library partnering with other uh, elements within the institution to be able to do, have the back end repository that uh, um, Bob is referring to in a, as a place of archiving, preserving, you know, curating all of the content and a lot of the interesting content that's particularly coming out of digital humanities, which is not text-based, and then having a presentation layer that pulls that all together that supplies the metrics that we've seen. I can't remember, I think it may even have been Jerry who, who um, uh, showed those examples. So that when X comes in and wants to see, so who is Jerry Doherty or what's he doing now, they land on a page wherever that sits that person doesn't need to know where it is. The important thing is that it presents. It's the accessibility layer, the visual presentation layer that has all his research there um, and everything that he's working on and everything that's behind it. And maybe, thinking of Bernard Lentier and, other, Rentier and others, maybe if you legally can't put it up, you have a button that's called request a copy. Does anyone want to respond to that? Jerry. I mean, I agree. I, th I, think, um, I think Linda's um, kind of binary thing between curation and, and access is a really good one to work with, actually, because it, it, it's, it's clear there are two functions there. And I must say, one thing I think researchers don't want is when they go into that website to find, the, the, sure, they want to find the papers there, but what they don't necessarily need is all the metrics alongside it. So it's actually quite annoying to go to somebody's website and to read that there's something there saying how many times this has been cited. You're not really worried about how many times it's been cited. The question is, is this work that's of interest to you and is it of value? And I think 
institutions from time to time are conflating those two functions by bunging all that information onto the one place, when in fact what you need is the in almost the curation side is where you get all the, the metrics kind of stored away. But on the access side, you just go straight to the paper and then it's up to the researcher to decide what he or she thinks of the work. And actually, any researcher will look at those numbers and just say, well, I want to read the paper first before I reach any judgment as to where this, um, you know, what sort of value I attach to it. So I think, I think that, that thinking, thinking through how that's all presented in light of that, that dichotomy that Linda outlined, I think, is really useful. And it might then help clarify what information goes up where. audience? I'm going to ask a question. Is my right to ask a question? Um, we've talked about the challenges for the future and, and positioning ourselves for the future and envis envisioning where we need to be moving toward and there's some tension between some of those elements. We have um, certainly uh, some challenging uh, issues and demands in terms of the research of our institutions, but we also have some in the learning and teaching area. I was wondering if anyone would like to comment on how you're balancing or how you're trying to meet the demands in those two areas, because sometimes they're different skill sets. Uh, you know, we, ha we, have, we work with a finite envelope of um, human resources uh, and, and budget around human resources. Anyone like to comment on what they've been thinking about recently or thinking forward to how, how they might um, put some strategies in place in that, in that environment? Sorry, it's too tough. I won't mention workforce planning. Um, but I, I do um, sometimes reflect on the fact that the library is one of the few areas in the university that needs to have a dual focus. So the Office of Research is research, and the Learning and Teaching Unit is learning and teaching, but the library is both t uh, learning and teaching and research, and that does present us with a challenge in terms of a planning. Um, and I think one way forward is uh, around specialisation, and many of us here have um, approached that in different ways. Uh, but I, I think that's something for the future in terms of looking at how we specialise and developing those skill sets. And there are different models. So one way we've done it uh, with moving into new services is to have a specialist position created, um, have that person sort of break the new ground, um, iron out all the wrinkles, and then we have a process of operationalising that to faculty librarians. So that's just one model and one approach about developing the new skill set and then uh, using your existing workforce to, to spread that service. Uh, the, other thing I'd, the other thing I'd say is that, um, and Judy said it earlier, it, it depends on the context in which you're operating. So your own university will have different sets of priorities. Um, and Sam Drake quite clearly articulated priorities within her university as a bit of a contextual factor. Mine will be different, QUT's will be different, um, Rob will certainly be different. A and so that will influence how you're developing your capability and where you're putting your resources because it will be in part driven by what the university is saying is of most critical importance to it at that point in time in its journey. But one thing we can't afford to do, and it's an awful is to just keep on loading jobs onto our existing staff mm -hmm. and expect them to do more and more and more and not take things away that we no longer need to do. And that one's a really hard one. So can I, I'd like to speak a little bit about that. We've sort of got to kill the sacred cows and mm -hmm. perhaps uh, one of the things we need to do is get out of the more of the transactional side of things. Um, RFID, some profiles, PDAs, that sort of thing, to free up your space with your, your staff to do these more interesting things, the niche, niches that we want to find. And I think that's uh, the killing of the sacred cows is the way to go about it. And perhaps transactionally is, 
certainly the approach that you know, we're looking at ACU is a way to find ourselves a bit of space to do some of these things within a, a staffing budget which is constant. Yeah, and I think that's, that's often an internal challenge more than an, uh, a client-facing one. Um, and it's about helping staff to see that there is other value they can bring if they let go of that thing that's been so precious to them over time. But in fact, there's something of greater value they can be contributing back to the institution. So it, it's how you create that conversation to make it a safe transition. Um, it is about giving up some of our sacred cows, but we've been talking about giving up sacred cows now for quite a while. Um, and we have been doing it. I think patron-driven acquisitions is one area where I think it has made a significant difference. I'd like to be a little bit facetious, perhaps. I don't know that we're there yet. Perhaps this whole, whole idea of e-texts is an area that we don't delve into too much. I mean, libraries, universities, libraries haven't traditionally been the provider of textbooks for individual students. We have had a collection and it's normally the first part of the collection that's weeded after a few years as well when new editions come out, when that subject is no longer taught, etc. Um, maybe we, maybe that's one of our sacred cows we seriously have to think about. Why not give e-text role over to the publishers and let them deal directly with students if they want to? We provide that added value of advice to academics about licensing agreements and advice to students about what they should be aware of. It's an area I think we should look at a little bit more seriously. Thanks, Ruth. Any other questions? Hi, it's um, Sue again, Uni of the Sunshine Coast. Um, I'm just wondering, with all the talk about research, this is harking back to Sandra's talk, um, are we leaving the undergraduate students behind and how are we going to support them in the future? Uh, most definitely not. Um, I think the support that we can provide for undergraduates is that value-added support. Um, the support of an expert librarian who can guide them through all this information maze. Um, not to have a collection of textbooks sitting on shelves electronically or not, um, but to help them access this material, to help them use it when it's there. So I, I think there's a lot of value added we can do for the undergraduates. I guess the other thing I'd say is that what they expect of us is not what we might think they expect of us and we need to continually be checking in with them about what it is that they need and how best we can assist them. Another question up the back. Carolyn? Um, Carolyn MacDonald from Griffith. While we're talking about sacred cows, I'd like to refer back to Bob's comment about the study guides and the lib guides. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, it's a subject that's very dear to my heart um, in similar lines to those that, that opinion you expressed, Bob. Um, but I think one of the questions that that raises for me is, you know, I'm sure we could all come up with some ideas about how we could do that more collaboratively and how we could, you know, get a better outcome uh, from all of that repeat work that we're doing. I'm, I'm just wondering if any of the university librarians have actually thought about um, which areas we consider that we are actually competitive in and which areas that we can just let go and collaborate to our heart's content because there is actually no competitive advantage in those areas. Because I think if we had some clear thought about that, it would be a whole lot easier to just get together and do stuff. Would you like that as an action I, item for the I first meeting? I don't think there are any competitive areas, yeah. Carolyn. Neither no, do I. I don't, there's nothing I, I would hold on to. We share everything, we believe share me. <laughs> we share intimately. Yeah. <laughs> well, you do. <laughs> It reminds me of a conversation I had with the director of HR at the University of Melbourne who said University of Melbourne's not great because it has brilliant HR services. 
Um, she was absolutely right, they were pretty awful. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's a great university and, and I think we do have to be a bit careful about how important we think we are. Um, that's not to say we aren't important and we don't add value, but in terms of competitive advantage, uh, there was a librarian at an institution not too far from here who seriously believed that she could deliver competitive advantage to her university by growing the collection significantly. Um, I doubt any of those arguments wash anymore um, in the sort of world we inhabit. So I think we do have to think very differently about what that value add is and how we demonstrate that value. Um, but, but I think to think we add competitive advantage is probably a bridge too far. If anything, I think we've got more to gain by collaborating. Mm. And libraries have shown that for decades. So, you know, we share things and then we get ideas from each other. And I mean, the whole repository uh, situation in this country, something that this country can be very proud of, um, the, the maturity of our repository arrangements is based on this massive big collaboration where all the university libraries help each other. So, uh, yeah, no, I think we've got more to gain from collaboration. That might be a good note to finish on if the questions have dried up. Is there anyone out there wanting, burning, wanting to ask a burning question? No. You all want to go to drinks. <laughs> at, at this point, uh, I really would like to thank a number of people. I'd like to thank all of our um, panellists, our um, targets um, for the questions this afternoon. Uh, Jeanette Wright, uh, State Librarian, State Library of Queensland. Ruth Quinn from Charles Darwin University because I didn't introduce them at the beginning. <laughs> um, Jim Graham from uh, Australian Catholic University. Wendy Abbott from Bond University. Alison Hunter from University of Southern Queensland. <laughs> Sandra and Linda and Judy and Bob you met earlier. First name is okay. Well, it's getting to the end of the day. Um, and certainly um, to thank again Jerry Doherty um, for his um, for his uh, introduction uh, to the whole afternoon. And thank you all for um, being part of the uh, proceedings this afternoon, either here or uh, at the end of the um, streaming session. I can't do any. I cannot forget to thank Lucy, who um, has done a tremendous amount of work for uh, this event today and um, also um, for the whole of the two days, today and tomorrow. So uh, QLOC wouldn't uh, operate as well as it does with all of the uh, uh, functions and events and meetings that happen without our Executive Officer, who is Lucy Peachy. I uh, want to thank uh, Griffith, venue, Griffith very much for the venue and for the streaming services, uh, services of our gentlemen over here and out there. And thank you as the audience uh, very much as well. One last, two last things. One of them is that uh, Lucy will be sending you a survey um, asking you for your comments about the forum. If you have the time to look at that early, that would be very helpful because tomorrow is the um, a planning day for the university librarians to look at future directions of QLOC, what we might do over the next um, two to three years. And it would be helpful if we had your comments as well as to what you would like to see from QLOC, what you would like that QLOC to deliver to you, what would be of value to you um, in your work and your professional career. So if you're able to do that um, overnight, I think Lucy will be get, is probably getting out almost as we speak. She's waved. Yes, she's doing that. So if you're able to flash some answers back to us, that, that would be really helpful because we'll have those for the, the planning session tomorrow. And finally, I'm just going to check my list. I haven't forgotten anything. Drinks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, um, that's the last one. Um, <laughs> Now I'd like to, we'd, we would like to invite you to drinks and canapes. Um, they're being held um, out the door here and down to the left in the QCA Art Gallery. So you ha can have both an opportunity to um, provide sustenance to the mind and heart as well as to the stomach. 
Thank you all once again. We'll see you next year.